Today we are going to talk about entropy and about second law of thermodynamics, about third law of thermodynamics, and finally about chemical equilibrium. And to start this class, we should start with second law of thermodynamics. And there are many different versions of second law of thermodynamics. Uh, they are equivalent. I give you just many of them. So first one, no process is possible where heat is converted into work with 100% efficiency. This is one of the definitions. I give you a few more. They may sound a bit strange. They are not consistent with each other, but turns out that the, the same. Uh, yeah. Next one. Every natural process is irreversible. The word reversible, irreversible, you should remember. Reversible means something what can change direction back. And irreversible, it means something what cannot change the direction back. Another way of stating the second law of thermodynamics is in every natural process, entropy grows. Or finally, the last one I give you. Every natural process goes from order to disorder. which generally means that if you have a process, then for this process, the change of entropy is always larger or equal to zero. Which brings a natural question when it's larger and when it's equal to zero. So we have two cases. This one happens for reversible process. Mm. 
And this one happens for irreversible process. And again, natural question to ask, which one is reversible, which one is irreversible? How to find examples of irreversible or reversible processes? Turns out that virtually everything is reversible, uh, irreversible. And if you try to find examples of these processes, you cannot find any. But many processes that are irreversible, if they are done very slowly, like slow heating, slow expansion, they are almost reversible. So the entropy is almost constant for such processes. Good. So we introduced the term entropy, and as so far we only know how to change, how to calculate the change in entropy. And the change in entropy will be calculated as a heat given in a reversible way to the system at temperature T. You see, that I have to always add reversible rev because otherwise I cannot have the equal sign. Good. So I have the change in a process, change of entropy in a process. Uh, given as a definition, heat given to the system divided by temperature when it's happening. Okay, uh, how to calculate it? It's much better to calculate the real entropy as a sum or an integral of small entropies, which is calculated. like that. Or very often this can be calculated as a heat capacity times the temperature change divided by T. This is the change of entropy for heating processes. Let us calculate few changes of entropy for few processes. You see that it's nothing really difficult, it's kind of natural. So first example, change in entropy for heating from T1 to T2. So we have delta S is the integral from T1 to T2 dS. The integral from T1 to T2 dQ over T. C times dT over T. Here we have to stop because we can have generally two possibilities. First possibility is that delta S and second possibility is the delta S We know that the heat capacity is different, different at constant volume or at constant pressure. So we have to distinguish between two cases. Heating at constant volume or heating at constant pressure.
Good. But let's continue with this one. So we have delta S equal integral from T1 to T2 with C, which can be P or V. I don't distinguish now, but we know that finally I should use one of them, times the T over T. Now, if T1 and T2 are not too far from each other, we can assume that heat capacity is a constant function of temperature, and we can take it out of integral for sake of being honest, I should put the sign almost equal here. T1, T2 over dt over t. This integral can be very easily calculated. Of course, it is equal to T2 minus ln T1. Or in other words, it is Sc ln T2 over T1. So I know how to calculate the change of entropy for heating. It's kind of easy. So coming back to these equations, I know that this is equal to CV times CP times T2 over T1. Let's take another process. Here we had a heating from T1 to T2. Now let's take a expansion of a perfect gas from volume one to volume 2 at constant pressure, a uh, constant temperature. How to calculate this one? We start exactly the same way. We have that entropy is the integral from V1 to V2 of small entropies, which is equal, of course, to V1, V2, dq reversible over t. Hmm, now, how to calculate the heat of expansion of perfect gas? Well, here we should use the first law of thermodynamics. which says that for isolated system, the change of internal energy is equal to the heat well, I should say rather for the closed system here Sorry. So for the closed system, it's the heat plus work. It's equal to zero. So from this one, we have that the heat is equal to minus work. And if this process is done in the reversible way, then we have so we use this here. We have that this is minus V1, V2 minus D over T. Now, what is the work for the expansion? Oh, that's already much easier to calculate. We know that the 
reversible work is minus P external times uh, we can say dV as a small work. And now you remember that if that if this was reversible, then the P internal was equal to the P external. The difference of pressure inside the system and outside of the system must be very similar to assure that this is a reversible process. So instead of PX, I can use here P internal. I put this one in this equation. So the minus minus will cancel and I get P times dV over T. Good. Now I'm going to integrate over volume. Temperature is constant, so temperature doesn't change. I can take it out of integral, but the pressure will change during the process. So I have to change the pressure inside into a volume. I know that PV equal nRT. So I know that the pressure would be equal to nRT divided by V for ideal gas. I put it inside this equation. I put it inside this equation and what I find is I have the volume V1, V2 over, instead of pressure, I have nRT divided by volume times T times dV. Now, you see that the temperature, in fact, will simplify. And I'm finally getting the integral nR from V1 to V2 dV over V, which of course can be easily calculated like this one, and it is equal to nR natural logarithm of V2 over V1. You can go farther with this. You can ask what happens when the expansion of ideal gas the volume is not changed but the pressure is changed hmm. well, at constant temperature the both are changed, volume and pressure at the same time. But what I want is that the expansion of ideal gas starts from starting pressure P1 and final pressure P2. Uh, P2. And of course at constant temperature. Now, I could possibly calculate all the way like this and finally get some formula, but it's enough to notice that at the initial pressure, this is equal to nRT, and of course, this is also equal to P2 V2, because the temperature didn't change. So from this one, I'm getting uh, P1 divided by P2 equal V2 divided by V1. And now I can directly use the result I calculated before, which is nR V2 V1 here. And I can put instead of V2 V1, P1 P2. So as you see, calculating entropy change for some simple processes is not too difficult. Now we should consider how the entropy is changing for some more difficult processes. You will see that this is not really a big problem. 
entropy change for vaporization. Now, when you think about vaporization, liquid is becoming gas. This is usually happening at constant pressure, but not constant volume. So P constant. If this is true, then I have change of entropy. Ah, and of course, vaporization also happened at constant temperature. You remember the heating curves we are drawing last class. During the vaporization or melting, the temperature doesn't change even if you add heat to the system. So what you have is the amount of heat added to the system in the reversible way divided by the temperature of vaporization. But now, this is happening at constant pressure. You know that at constant pressure, the heat given to the system is nothing else like the change of enthalpy. So it's called vaporization enthalpy that you take from the tables. So it's very too easy to calculate this entropy of vaporization. Five, fusion or melting, as you prefer. That would be very similar. Again, you have entropy of fusion is the heat given to the system in the reversible way. divided by the temperature of fusion, which again is equal to the enthalpy of fusion divided by the temperature of fusion. Now you go farther, you go to chemical reaction. Let's say you have A plus B giving you C and D. Let's put some coefficients, N, M, S, and T. And this is my reaction. I want to calculate the entropy change for this reaction. Then the entropy change for the reaction is equal to S times the entropy of C plus T times the entropy of D minus N times the entropy of A minus M times the entropy of B. So in the general process, in the general reaction, Entropy of the reaction is the sum of the uh, P equal products. Minus the sum of the reactants. Let's do some more complicated example. You know that, for example, for water, the vaporization happen happens at 100 degrees. But if you have an open pot with water at room temperature, after some time, the water is gone. So the vaporization really happened not at 100 temperature, but at 25 degrees. How to calculate the vaporization entropy that time? Is it enough to put 25 degrees here? Turns out, no, it's more complicated. So we have the example number seven. Vaporization of water at 25 degrees Celsius. 
So if you want to calculate the entropy change for such process, first you have to calculate the following thing. There will be the entropy change for heating H2O liquid from 25 to 100 plus plus the entropy of vaporization of water and plus entropy change of cooling down but this time not liquid water but gas water, vapor water from 100 Celsius to 25 Celsius. So you see, this is not very complicated. Just first you heat, then you vaporize at 100, and then you cool down. So opposite than heating. Good. Uh, in this equation I've been using not a change of entropy but entropy. How to get this number? How to find this number? Uh, so far I didn't say a word about finding these numbers. And to get some idea how to find these numbers I introduce now so-called third law of thermodynamics. And the third law of thermodynamics says for a perfect crystal if temperature goes to zero Kelvin then entropy goes to zero. What is the meaning of this one? If you have a perfect crystal, every atom has a one and only one position, which, yeah, I come to this later. Only one position, then if you go to zero Kelvin, it means that the thermal movements of every atom becomes very, very small. And this is what you called perfect order, the maximal perfect order. And there is only one possibility, possibility of ordering a system in that way. And since you remember from the last class that entropy was the logarithm of the number of ways of ordering, then since there is only one way of ordering, the logarithm of this is becoming zero. So this is the third law of thermodynamics saying that at zero Kelvin, you have the entropy equals zero. Now, how to find the entropy at temperature T? Well, it's simple. You just start that this is the entropy in the temperature zero, which for the perfect crystal is zero, plus the integral from zero to T dS. How to find this one? Again, it's S at zero, and now plus from zero to T, I'm showing that this from the definition is just heat given in a reversible way to the system divided by the temperature.
Okay, this gives us some idea how to measure this thing because of course this one can be a bit further transformed to the following form S at 0 plus 0 T let's say we do it at constant pressure dt uh, over t. What we can do, we can set up the following experiment. Here we have T. And here we have CP divided by T. Now we can measure this curve and finally calculate the field between zero and temperature T. This field would be equal to the entropy. So usually the entropy of every substance at a given temperature is found from experimental measurement of this curve. And you have some more details about this measurement in your book. I, I will not discuss it into details much more. So the way of finding the real entropy, it starts from the third law of thermodynamics. When you start with the zero entropy, zero Kelvin entropy, and you add the temperature contributions to entropy. So now somebody may say, I just say in the perfect crystal, the third law of thermodynamics says that this one is zero. But I still keep this one. If this is zero, maybe it's just enough to cross this over. Turns out that not for every chemical you can kick it out. For example, for metals, yes, you can remove it, but there are many chemicals that have something what is called residual entropy. Now I will tell a few words about the residual entropy. Some chemicals at temperature equal zero Kelvin have entropy at zero non equal to zero. This non zero entropy is called residual entropy. I give you example of such chemical. Example would be surprisingly simple, H2O. Ice crystal doesn't have entropy zero at the zero Kelvin. And now maybe explanation. What does it mean that the entropy is not zero at zero Kelvin? It means there is more than one way of ordering the atoms inside the crystal. And when you think about the crystal of ice, you may think that the oxygens, they make a perfect diamond type structure so what I'm plotting here these are oxygens now with the red I will plot hydrogens now every oxygen has two hydrogens I can put these hydrogens here and here, 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 and here and here. There are six different possibilities of ordering this water molecule inside this crystal. 
Now you know that on average, between every oxygen and oxygen, there is one hydrogen. But the point is that this hydrogen can be here, making a real bond here, and oxygen bond here, a hydrogen bond there. Or this hydrogen can be closer to this one, making the real bond here, and the hydrogen bond to this one. So you see that at zero Kelvin, even if the atoms are not moved, the hydrogen must be here or here, one of these two positions. Now, this is true about every bond. The hydrogen has a choice of being here or here, here or here, here or here. And finally, because of this freedom of occupying this place or this place, the number of possibilities of putting the water molecule in the crystal is larger than one. And finally, water has a residual entropy at zero Kelvin. Good, let's continue. Very often, you will see that people are not writing entropy, but people are writing entropy with the dot. This is called standard entropy. And what it means is that the pressure is equal one bar. I don't remember. I may have said during the last class that the pressure must be one atmosphere. If I said so, that was a mistake. Must be one bar. So we have the standard entropy. And of course, it follows that we have also standard entropy of vaporization standard entropy of fusion, standard entropy of reaction, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, usually for molecules, we are not using this symbol, but using another symbol with small m here. This is the molar standard entropy. So in other words, the entropy of one mole of a given chemical. And this thing and this thing are the basic quantities that I'm going to use at, till the end of this class. Let me prepare some space. The enthalpy of formation of a given molecule that is deciding if molecule is stable or not, because we could find both examples when this was larger than zero and when this one was smaller than zero. Both is possible. So how to find if a molecule is, or a process, is stable or not stable? The answer is that what decides if a process is stable or not, or a molecule is stable or not, is the entropy, change in the entropy. Namely, if the change of the entropy for forming a molecule is larger than zero, then molecule is stable. Mm -hmm. This is a bit strange sentence because the formation of a molecule never happens in the closed or isolated system. It always happens in the open system, or almost always happens in the open system. And then this one has a bit different meaning than from usual. Because we should consider our system inside. And of course, we should consider 
the change of entropy inside the system. But we know that this system is encircled by some surrounding. And you also have a change of entropy of this surrounding. So when I'm here, I'm saying that the change of entropy is larger or zero, what I really mean is the total entropy. And when I mean total entropy, I mean the change of the entropy inside the system plus the change of the entropy in the surrounding. So let's consider a reaction, chemical reaction happening here. When you have chemical reaction here, this chemical reaction is producing heat or opposite, it's absorbing heat. It's exothermic or it's endothermic. Now, this heat is transferred outside or from outside to inside if it's endothermic. So we have the heat flow during the chemical reaction. So that's how the entropy of the surrounding is changing. We know that would be the uh, T1 to T2 dQ reversible by T. Okay, now we know that during the reaction the heat is transferred. Let's assume the reaction is happening very slowly, then we can assume it's a reversible reaction. Of course, it nev never happens like that, but sometimes we can control it to make it almost reversible. And now we divide by the temperature of the transfer. But look, the surrounding is huge. You can imagine that your chemical reaction would be I don't know, hydrogen and oxygen making into water and this is happening inside a huge ocean. Now when this is happening, this is producing heat, but the temperature of the ocean will not change. So my point is that this is really happening at the same temperature. So we rather should write here from state one to state two. And the temperature is constant. If the temperature is constant, I can take it out of the integral. And now, before reaction, after reaction, and I just sum all the heat transferred in this reaction. But if this is happening in the constant pressure, I can just write that this is equal to uh, the change of the enthalpy of the reaction divided by the temperature. Now I should think for a moment about the sign because if the reaction was exothermic it means the heat was transferred outside and the entropy of the reaction will go up. So there should be a minus sign here. Good. I can come back to this equation. I am finding that the formation of a molecule or any reaction is, uh, formation of a molecule is stable or for reaction is happening uh, in a spontaneous way only if delta S plus the, in this reaction larger than zero.
I can transform this equation a bit. I can multiply by temperature. Note that this is not a problem first. Temperature is always positive. So if I multiply this, nothing happens. Second, since it's positive, the sign doesn't change. I'm getting T minus larger than zero. Then I can multiply by minus one. What I'm getting after this multiplication is delta H reaction minus T delta S smaller than zero. Multiplying by minus one changing the sign of the reaction, of the inequality. Good. So finally, I found what is the condition for mass reaction to be spontaneous or what is the condition for my molecule to be stable? So first, for the reaction, I have the equation change of enthalpy in the reaction minus change of the entropy in the reaction multiplied by temperature must be smaller than zero. Then the reaction happens. For the molecule, I have similar condition that formation enthalpy of this molecule minus the formation of this molecule entropy must be smaller than zero. Then this molecule is stable. Now you probably remember that some time ago I defined you four thermodynamic functions. Two of them we've been using a lot and two of them maybe have some use today. Uh, one of them was the internal energy. Next one was the enthalpy defined as the internal energy plus PV. Next one uh, was so-called Helmholtz free energy given as U minus TS. A last one that was given as a U plus PV minus TS or in other words as H minus TS was the Gibbs, Gibbs free energy. Let us think what happens when this Gibbs free energy is changing. So we have G equal H minus TS and we have delta G equal delta H minus delta T times S minus S delta T. Um, <coughs> S times delta T minus T delta S. Good. Now, what happens when the change is happening at T equal constants? Then this is of course equal to change in delta H minus you see that if temperature is constant, the change of temperature is zero and this term is vanishing, minus T delta S. Now, this equation I got now, the change of Gibbs free energy at constant temperature turns out to be identical to this term I calculated here. So this one is change of Gibbs free energy for the reaction at constant temperature. And this is so-called Gibbs 
formation energy of a molecule at constant temperature. And now you see that if the reaction must be, if the reaction is happening, this one must be smaller than zero. If the molecule is stable, this one must be smaller than zero. Why so much talking about this? Why this is so important? Because these numbers are usually given to you. If you open your book at the end, and the appendix A, well, in the appendix two, in fact, you have chemical molar mass enthalpy of formation, which is this one. Next column says free energy of formation which is this one. Next one says molar heat capacity, or which we know from before. And finally, the last one is the molar entropy that we discussed today before. And if you go through this table, you see that for every chemical there is a number. Well, I shouldn't be you shouldn't say like that. For some chemicals, there are no numbers because we don't know them yet. Now, everything what is in this table is at a temperature 25 degrees. So you see, temperature is constant, and in this table, the temperature is always 25 degrees. Now, let's say you have chemical reaction. For this chemical reaction, you have calculated delta G. Ah, of course, what I was discussing every, everything before is just the, all the quantities are at any pressure. Now I'm assuming that this is a standard Gibbs energy, which means it happens at one bar. In fact, everything you will calculate will be always at one bar. So somebody calculated or measured the Gibbs free energy for this reaction, and they found three cases. First, it was equal to zero. Second case, it was larger than zero. And finally, the last case, it was smaller than zero. What is happening in these three cases? If th that was exactly equal to zero, it means that AB doesn't want to become CD, CD doesn't want to become AB, none of the sites is more stable. So in this condition there is no reaction. What happens when this delta G was larger than zero? Ah, then it means that in fact this reaction is happening. Because for this reaction, the delta G would be negative. And finally, when somebody calculated that delta G was smaller than zero, then this reaction was happening.
which kind of answers the question that we usually have, H2 plus O2 Is it okay to write this reaction like that? Generally it's okay, but the problem with this notation and with this notation is that here you have delta G smaller than zero and here you have delta G larger than zero and usually you choose the notation where delta G is smaller than zero to write the, to write the reaction Let's do a few examples. Typical questions that you will have during the final exam will be like that. Which has higher entropy? Now, you remember the entropy is the tendency of, it's a measure of disorder. Which of these two things is more disordered? I2 or BR2? I2, hands up. BR2, hand up. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, this is true, this is more disorder, and the reason for this is that I2, iodine, is a solid. But Br2 is a liquid. And liquids are usually more disordered than iodine. And if you look in the tables, you find that entropy, standard molar entropy for iodine, is 116 joule per kelvin. And standard molar entropy for bromine is 152 joule per Kelvin. Next question. Which one has higher entropy? Let's do once again. Okay, both of them are organic molecules. As you see, both of them have five carbons and both of them have 10 hydrogens. which is five, which is six. Well, so very close. Uh, turns out that this one. 
And now I explain the reason why. Okay, imagine what is happening to this molecule and imagine what is happening to this molecule. When, the, when it's higher temperature. This one is a ring. The ring will be maybe twisting, but doesn't break. But this one can do all possible strange movements. The energy, kinetic energy of this one will be larger because of that. Larger number of possible conformers in the space. So usually when you have a choice of molecules that have this shape, long shape, and something with this closed shape, usually the long shape will have higher entropy. Now, another way of thinking about that is asking you, if you have a box, and you put inside the box matches, something that has this shape, and you have another box, and put inside the disks like that. And now you shake up both boxes. What happens? In this case, this one will be all possible, they will be totally mixed. But this one with the round shapes, they will be kind of mixed, but the mixing degree will be smaller. Similar thing happens here. The two molecules or three molecules will all possible angles, but this one, which is almost a circular, will come with the next circulars much better ordered. Okay, so this is one type of possible question. Which one has higher entropy? Another type of possible question is, they give you a following data. Cu, O, solid, plus SO3 gas reacting CuSO4 solid and what they really ask you is the arrow should be that direction or the arrow should be that direction which reaction is really happening Somebody who has some chemical experience knows that this one makes very nice green-blue crystals. And that can be outside for a long, long time. They doesn't change to gas. So we know that this goes this direction. But very often, the chemicals are more complicated, and then you don't know. What to do in this case? You have to calculate delta G. So for this reaction, for this reaction, I can calculate the delta G using the formation data of CuSO4 in the solid state from the tables that I just showed you a moment ago, minus G formation And turns out that this number is minus 161 kilojoule per mole. The most important is negative. And since it's negative, the reaction goes this direction. If it would be positive, we know that the arrow should point there. <laughs>